Va bene, grazie. Ok, so we start today to analyze uh, uh, one possible process uh, for designing uh, ambient intelligence systems. Just to give, our, uh, to give ourselves some rules uh, how to proceed, what are the phases, what are the steps uh, uh, that we want to follow. And uh, um, what do we mean with uh, defining a process? Well, uh, if I take the definition of a design process in the engineering area, I would take the second definition, because the, the one for Wikipedia, I don't like it too much because it's, uh, there's a couple of, of, uh, of points that uh, don't, don't apply actually to our cases. So the engineering design process, so defining a process means uh, designing, deciding and uh, formulating a plan. Okay, a plan made of different steps, different uh, uh, orders of, uh, uh, of uh, operations, of action, of activities, so that a team of people, team of engineers, the original definition was just one engineer, but today there's nothing that can be done by one person. So it's always a team of person can build a system, the original definition had product, but we want it to be, say, wider, a system with specified goals. So if I have some goals, what are the steps do I need to follow to reach those goals? What do I need to do first? What do I need to do later? What does need to be repeated? What needs to be checked? And so on. This, how, how I organize uh, my activities is specific uh, of the process that I choose to use. And they may, we may use different processes in different contexts. Uh, uh, and so we are trying to define uh, one type of process that fits uh, our specific needs in our case. Okay? Uh, well, I will give you these uh, uh, comics for, for reading later. It talks about uh, um, uh, having, uh, uh, no, for having some, funs, uh, some fun uh, about the definition of a, of a process. Um, so, in, we first uh, start thinking about what kind of process we can uh, define, and then we go into details uh, about the steps of this process. Uh, today we will see nearly half of that, uh, or a bit less, uh, and then next week we will see the, the, the other half. Um, the process I'm trying to describe uh, tends to be, okay, first of all, it's one of the possible processes. It's not the only one, it's not the best one, but it's one that more or less fits uh, the way in which we are thinking, we are approaching the ambient intelligence uh, topic in this course. But even if the process is already for our point of view, from our point of view, uh, you will see that the process that I try to describe is too complex and too heavy to be deployed uh, in the time we have, in the hours you have in the labs and so on. And so at the end, we'll try to say, say, okay, in the ideal process, you should do this, but in this course, we just limit ourselves to something much simpler. But first, we need to have the general picture of what would be the goal, and then we can do some discounts uh, on ourselves uh, uh, to do something, to reach the goal with uh, maybe less uh, uh, less effort, uh, even if we are paying some, let's say, quality or precision in the, in the, during the way. Hmm. Okay, so uh, why do we need a process? Well, this is a picture that in different forms you will find on every software engineering book, or, or more in general, it should be in, on every book, or every book about engineering. So some, saying something about uh, what is the system that uh, the customer wants? Uh, what the customer really needs? It's in the bottom here. But actually, all the people who are involved in the design process from different points of view, for different roles, always uh, understand something different. Even the user itself, the first vignette is how the user explained it. So the user wanted this, but this is something that in the back of his mind is what he wants. But then when he, the user tries to explain, okay, I want this, it will tell something which is a bit different 
and to a person that will understand it in a different way again. And uh, the analysis will find something different and the programmer will create something uh, that is not matching and so on. So uh, you just see here all the different uh, people that are involved. I think the funniest one are how the project was documented, nothing. So this is uh, very sad for all of us. Uh, and the wall, how the customer was built for something stratospheric and uh, <laughs> in, in change of, uh, and it was not supported at all. But that's just a picture for having fun. But just keep in mind that we have many people that work, play around a, a project, a system. Each of them understands the project or the system from their own point of view. And the communication and that the alignment of these different points of view, being sure that every people understand the same thing, is one of the hottest topics in designing a process. A process can, should guarantee that when you start with something, you, then, we, you end up with the same thing. Hmm? And our goal today would be to analyze one possible approach among the many ones that can be proposed, uh, and an approach that should be designed for our own type of systems, okay? Um, and the process is a mix of activities, something you have to do, and of results. So after you do this, what you get? You get a document, you get a software, you get a plan, you get a picture, and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, so always uh, uh, activities, and each activity has some specific output, and this output is normally the, st the starting point for the next uh, activity, and so on. And finally, we will define a scaled-down version, as I said at the beginning. What are the characteristics of the process we are trying to define? Well, first of all, I want the process to be technology-neutral. And this is the approach that we are taking very strongly in this course. So we don't, I don't want to decide at the beginning, OK, I want to build a system that uses this kind of components, this kind of technology, this kind of brand, this kind of suppliers. Okay, it's something that I want to design, decide during the, during the process, not at the beginning. I want to be able to select the best technological solutions given the goal that I have. So my goal is not to sell or to use components of this manufacturer. The goal is to find the manufacturer that gives me the best or the most suitable components for the specific goal I'm trying to reach. Okay? So this is one, one point that makes the process different from what you find in many uh, say design uh, or, or even uh, smart house uh, uh, design, designers, hmm? where there are people that maybe specialize in one technology and tend to apply that specific technology to the different use cases that they find during their work. And uh, um, we try to be open and efficient, meaning, then, meaning that if I know that for one specific component or functionality, there is something available in the market, I try to use it. If I don't find anything, well, then I might, I might consider building it. So I will not uh, start by saying I only use components that are available on the market. That would be one position. And I don't want uh, even the other position that would be I will try to build my sensors, my actuators, my everything. From scratch, from with do it yourself or with electronic board and so on. Let's try to be open and uh, to both possibilities. OK? Um, and of course, if there is a component which is already available in the market, I will try to use it if it has the precision, the cost, uh, the speed, and all the characteristics that I need. Otherwise, I will try to consider building one. So there will be a point in which we decide, make, uh, say, the make or buy, or buy. Do I buy some component or do I make one? Hmm? Uh, of course, in our course, we will be limited by the types uh, of, of components that we have in the lab in some way. But OK, so the, the whole process will start from you or designer having an idea. It, this is what you are starting to do in these days with the platform. Just remind that uh, days are passing, and the deadline for having the list of good ideas is the 27. 
So try to be a bit more, a more active, <laughs> say, <laughs> in proposing and in commenting and in uh, voting so that uh, uh, ideally there should be 50 ideas and then 20 or 15 or 10 should emerge as good ones. Otherwise, we just have to, to stick to the first one hmm? and uh, it's better to, to improve it. By the way, the discussion would be, should be open even across the groups. So everybody, we are, we are trying not to step in and to say our, that's why we are not commenting on what you already started to, to write. Um, but uh, you should comment on the ideas by trying to, to give your suggestions or criticism, independently of the fact uh, that you will be or not in that group. The groups are not decided yet. So there are two parallel activities, forming the groups and finding very good ideas to work with. Okay, that will be assigned to groups, of course. Okay, so from the initial idea that we are starting, you see that the initial idea is not yet a plan for the system. It's not something that you can go and say, okay, please build me this with those descriptions. You need to do a more work to, 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 to detail it better. But the end point will be something that is working and possibly matches you know, the, the structure of an ambient intelligence system. So the type of process we are proposing is summarized by this picture. I try to define seven steps. So the, the legend is that uh, you have activities which are rectangles and uh, artifacts, uh, so something which is the output of an activity that may be documents uh, or tools, software or hardware tools. And uh, uh, you see that the, the general structure is that you have an activity that after this, it leads you to the next activity to do. So it's something to do. Now you have to, I don't know, understand the user interface. And once you have done it, you can go to the next step and do the next activity. So that's a plan, first, second, third. And uh, uh, in, the, in the arrow leading from activity to activity, you have uh, uh, the summary of what is the output of the first activity that may become the input of the next. So from uh, moving from activity to activity, you are leading forward some specific artifact. Artifact is a generic term for saying something that has been done, okay? Something tangible, visible, hmm? not just words or not just, okay, it went there. Um, and in some cases, or in, actually it will be in, in all of the cases, there can be some iterations so that you can understand, maybe you, you discover in the next activity that some choices you did in the, first, in the previous one are not good. Because later when you study it better, you find that it costs too much, it doesn't work, it doesn't have the functionality you, you wanted. So you have to go back and change your plan. Okay, what is the... In software engineering, uh, a process like this is called uh, like a waterfall model. You know, in a waterfall, water always flows from high to low and never goes back. Engineering doesn't work like this. Huh? There are many points in which you have to go back. Uh, so I try to, to describe it in this way, but uh, where I put some arrows where, where I see the most... Uh, likely points of iteration, but actually all the process is iterative. If I have something at the beginning and then at the end, when you are near to the end, I understand there's something wrong, that cannot work, I should not be afraid of going back and changing it. Okay. Um, I try, then I will go to the, to the individual boxes. I try to group these boxes and these activities roughly in two different areas. I call one the specification phase or sub-process, and the other is the development phase, where the, it's uh, iterative in the sense that we need and you will need uh, to build something that may be minimally working and then add features to that. So don't wait until the last minute to see something working. Don't hope that you can build a many 27 different pieces and then put together and expect them to work. Huh? It, we'll come to that later, but 
uh, you, you should build a minimally working system and then add the different features one after the other while keeping the system working incrementally. So that when the time uh, runs out, when you, you have something working. Because you already had it one month before or more. Even if it's, if it's not doing everything you planned, OK, but it's doing something. Now don't wait, don't wait until the, the very end for doing the integration of the system, because it's where real problems come out, usually. But the, the, this division, apart from the more emphasis on the iteration and all the modern agile methodologies, development methodologies, are insist very much on this aspect. But apart from that difference from a more linear to a more iterative process, what I also wanted to highlight is that in real cases, there may be, or usually, uh, the group or the company or the team that does the specification doesn't need to be the same as the group that does the development. So usually there are different groups or different companies that do this. Uh, you can do the outsourcing of the development to another, to an external company that will bring you the, pro the finished product uh, starting from your specifications. And so this is important because this arrow brings all the information you have about what system you want to build, bring this information to the people who are going to build it, actually. So it's critical that the information that flows in this arrow from the left to the right hand side of this picture should be as precise as possible. Because it's what you are paying for. If they do something different, okay, like the, the swing uh, in, in the picture, uh, if they are doing something different, if it's not written explicitly in this documentation that flows here, then it's your fault. You cannot blame them. Okay? The documentation says you need this. Okay? So if the documentation is not good, the fault is on the left side. So always try, when you are trying to proceed with the project, always try to imagine that you are not a group of have a few people that can keep everything in mind and understand the, the, the have a, a, a deep and shared understanding of the project. And so they don't need to write, they don't need to formalize, they don't need to, to sit down and, and fix the ideas. Always try to imagine, okay, but if tomorrow somebody else has to continue the work, do they, do they have the information about what we are thinking today to go further, to continue? Uh, that's the question we, we actually is worrying, it should worry us every day. Okay, if something changes, if shifted, uh, all the information that I have about the project is enough to let the project continue. Hmm? This will be a very big effort. We don't ask you in this course to do all of this, but I, 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 like, I would like you to understand at least the, the, the importance and the complexity of this. Um, okay, let's analyze uh, the first few steps. Uh, sorry, let's read, the, read them uh, at least once at the beginning. So I would start with a problem statement, stating the problem. What is the problem that we want to solve? And then at the bottom here, I have some document that I call the requirements document. So a document that describes the specifications, the requirements, the features, the characteristics of the system that we want to build to solve this problem. And how do, do we come up with this document? Okay, we could take our idea and decide the list of features that are needed to implement this idea. But this would be, would be very dangerous because then the initial designers would just plan and, or invent a system without confronting themselves, without interacting with the, with the users of the system, with the future users of the systems. And so it's very important to have a one phase between the, the point in which I know what problem I want to solve, and bef after that, and before 
I write down the specifications of the system, the features that it needs to implement, a phase in which I try to, I call it a requirements elicitation, means trying to get out some requirements from the people that will, be, will use the system. So trying to understand whether the system, I, okay, tomorrow morning I will have a very great idea. We'll change the world. It's fantastic, okay? I fell in love with, me, with my idea and I want to build the system. But will anybody else care? Will anybody else like the idea, like the system I'm building? Will they be happy with using that? Will they be willing to pay for that? Okay, if, if I love my idea, it's not enough huh, to force everybody else in the world to love that idea also. And if I find uh, that my idea is not so fantastic, or it may be improved, or there's some part of this idea which are not useful at all, if I find this out at the, at the end, after I built the system and I spent six months in developing it, it's a bit too late. I wasted a, bit of, a lot of energy. And I wasted a lot of uh, um, potential. I could have done potentially something much better, much more efficient. And maybe some other competitor looks, okay, that guy had a good idea, but he didn't understand it. I understand it better, and I do it better. So there's this phase in which we, under, we interact with the users. And then we okay, do the, the homework of uh, listing down all the requirements. And then we have the proper design phase and implementation, which is mainly straightforward. Uh, we have to define the architecture of the system. So what is the network? What is the hardware? What is the software? What are the interfaces? What are the sensors? What are the actuators? With a very general picture. How do the, what are the macro components and how they fit together, how they to communicate together? And after that, we need to select these components. Okay, I decided to have a network of sensors for getting the temperature of, the, of a set of rooms. Okay, let's select these components. In my architecture, they should be collected, they should be wired, they should, be wired, they should have some characteristics. Okay, let's find some. If, if we can find them and integrate them, well, otherwise we consider whether we have to, to build them and so on. And of course, uh, there's an iteration here because when you, okay, when you say, okay, you want to have a, a network of sensors like this and all that, uh, you will find that the sensors actually don't do what you expect uh, and then you need to change your plan, your change your architecture. You say, okay, not one network, maybe two of different types uh, and, uh, uh, and it will change. Um, at the end, you will have, uh, I call that the bill of material, so the, the list uh, of components that will be part of your system. And after that, uh, it's design and implementation. So writing software, building the hardware components, uh, installing the network, configuring the devices, and so on. When you finish the implementation, you have the hardware, the software, and network, and devices. You have the system in place. The project is not finished yet. You have something, uh, let's say, a technical system that does something. What you need to do at this point is test and validation. So the, does the system, the system does something, does it do the right thing? Is it correct? Does it have any bugs? And uh, user, uh, how do users like it? Do they appreciate it? Do they find problems? Hmm? So the testing is mainly testing whether it's correct and validation is validating whether it satisfies the user's needs. Because from the user needs that we imagined at the beginning, we did a long way, and so the final product, the final ring, may be different from what the other in mind at the beginning. And uh, the opinion of the users when they touch or they leave a system which is already built is much different from the opinion of the same users when you are just describing them how the system could work. When they use it, okay, they, they can give you a, a feedback which is much more precise than one, when you ask them to imagine what do you think, whether we could do this in your home. So 
So at, at the end, uh, what tells us whether the product or the system is finished uh, are the users. It's not that I, I finished to implement it. Finished to implement it is not enough. Now, my users are happy with that. Okay, that's the good end point. So, in very general terms. Let's start to analyze a bit uh, each of these blocks, right? So the problem statement is what uh, we are doing in this part of the course, actually. We're trying to find one significant problem to work on. And uh, we, sh we end up with a summary of a system description that describes in very, very simple and general terms what the system we are trying to build will do. Hmm? Define what problems need to be solved. Okay, the system should be useful. It should solve some <laughs> problems or try to solve some problems or try to help solving some problems. Okay? And so should give some benefits. First of all, for the users, because ambient intelligence should start from the users or and for the environment itself. Uh, for the users, okay, it's something that interacts or changes the environment in a way that the user perceives it immediately. But there are some systems, imagine for example, some system that manages the energy in your house, in your building in a more efficient way. So you don't have the direct perception that at the, at the end of your day, you, say, you save the 10 or 15% of your energy. Okay, in the long term, you will feel it where, because you are paying, paying less with your bills. But uh, the immediate benefit would be for the, for the ambient, for the environment, for the, let's say, physical quantity, the, the consumed energy of the system. But there should be a benefit. Okay, whether it's directly direct to the user or indirect through some better functioning of the environment that indirectly will benefit the user. Hmm? So we need to find one issue, there's something wrong today, and there's a solution that gives you some benefits. This is something that you, you must be able to describe to anybody without any technical background. Because we are talking about the problems and the benefit of the users, of the people. Okay, if, you are no, if we are not able to speak in these terms, uh, then we are doing technology push. We like to play with technology, so we try to invent something that uses the technology. And at the end, we create a, a brief summary, maybe just one, half a page or one page of a vision. I want to do that. It's not yet a specification. But it's a tool for understanding, first of all, ourselves, and then to communicate to the others what is the vision we have, where we want to get, what are the benefits. And we should avoid, as much as possible, to describe the technology. We should not write, OK, in our system, in this phase, in our system, we are using uh, GPS uh, positioning and, uh, and uh, local uh, uh, humidity sensors. Not yet. We are not speaking the language of the users in this case. And we are committing too early to some technical choice. And if we commit too early to a technical choice, we will maybe find much later, if, if this is the wrong choice, you will pay it by, redoing, by needing to redo everything from scratch. So let's do choices at the right moment. Never do choices design choices at the beginning without uh, first analyzing what are the alternatives. Hmm? So avoid making early technical choices. Avoid uh, describing your vision in terms of the technology. If you describe, uh, let's take an example, the Google Glasses, okay? You are not saying it's a pair of glasses with a camera and a screen and a sensor and accelerometer and uh, some uh, touch sensor and so on. Because people will stare at you and say, and so what? You will say that it's something that lets you communicate and have notification and give comments while walking, while speaking, and record and take pictures and so on. You describe what you do, what problem you solve, and how it benefits to you. Then how it's done, it's our job to do it right. 
okay? But all the process will take us there to the to the system. Of course, in ambient intelligence, this is a general statement up to now. In ambient intelligence, we have two main parts, the users and the environment. So we should describe, or define at least, the environment. So does this apply to an open space, to a school, to an hospital, to a house, to an office, or whatever? Or to the car, or to the trains? What is the environment in which we are working? I would be very skeptical of definition and say, okay, it can work in any environment, or, or we will decide it later. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult to find one specific activity that doesn't depend on the type, uh, if it's a classroom or an office. There's very, very few in common, and what is common is most likely not intelligent. Mm -hmm. And define the users. Who are the people who will be using on a daily basis our systems? Students, employees, travelers on a train, people who have a university degree or they don't have any higher level degree, they are all uh, speaking the same language or not. Uh, so uh, who is going to use the system? If we don't know where the system is going to be installed and what the users it will be de very difficult to say this will be useful. Because something that is useful for me, at my age, for example, may be totally relevant for you. Or vice versa. So we need to understand or select some, some target users. It's not just marketing. Okay? It's uh, features. So what are the features that you like best that may convince you or may, help, may let you perceive that the system is useful. And so you describe how the environment supports the users. Remember that supporting the user is uh, in the definition of ambient intelligence. Ambient intelligence system is something proactively uh, support the user. So we should never forget that the, the ultimate goal is this. So if I say an environment supports some users, I need to define the environment, I need to define the users, and I need to show how this supporting happens. Hmm? And uh, in this, we are always trying to target half a page or something like that. So we are not uh, writing a book. But in this page, uh, we should have all these elements. Otherwise, it's a symptom that we, we, for, we forgot about something. Okay? Uh, try to hint that we are not of course, in one page, you cannot say, this is a sensitive system because blah, 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 it's a responsive system because of this feature and so on. But try to let the reader look through what you write and identify these properties. Maybe not all of them. Depends on the system. Maybe not all of them. Especially in some prototype system that we are going to build, it will not be a full, uh, a fully uh, six-star um, ambient intelligence. But, but some of these, uh, try to ask yourself, did I, did, I, do, did I consider this aspect, did I consider this one, and so on. Hmm? And in writing, imagine selling it to a non-engineer. And so, you should let it read uh, by your grandmother, or by the people who are living uh, your, next to your door, or if, if they are not students, uh, uh, just to say, what do you understand from this description? Does it sound anything to you? Or is totally, because something that is, we, are, we engineers are very, are very strange uh, type of people, okay? And uh, we have very serious problems of communication with the rest of the world, because uh, the way we describe things, the terms we use, the assumptions we have in, in talking about tech. So this should be one uh, also aspect. So should, we should do, it's not easy. It's one page at most, but it will be, be very hard to, to, to do it in the right way. But if we have that, then it will, be, will, enable, will enable us to do to, 
to go easily to the next step. The next step is uh, getting, considering the opinions and the needs of, our, of the users. So we have this idea, we describe this idea in a way that uh, is readable by non-technical people and emphasizes the impact uh, on the people, on the users of the system. So we should go to the, to the users and they should kiss us for that. Oh, very good, that's nice, I like it because it fits for me. Well, maybe it will, never, it will not happen like that. But we need to understand what they would understand. If we write the first step, uh, the summary description, in, a, in, in a technical terms, we will never be able to use that with our users. And so we will tell to our users something, but then we have a system description that tells something else. We need to uh, be able, at least in the initial step, to keep the users engaged. Not only the users. Uh, here I, say I wrote uh, users and the stakeholders. Hmm? Users of the system, so the people who are going to use the system, plus the stakeholders, I will define them in a second. That will not may maybe be using directly the system, but be involved in it in some way. Collect the information, which is not so easy, because you, just know, you cannot just go there and say, what do you think about this? You will get very... Uh, shallow answers that don't have a very big information content. To have deeper answers, you have to stimulate. Uh, that's why they call it elicitation and not gathering of the requirements. Not just, okay, go there and try and ask what they think. You need to push them. There are methodology for doing that, for understanding what you think about this topic, even if you don't know it, or you are not able to speak explicitly about that, because maybe it's not in your domain, but I should understand it. Hmm? Uh, collect this information and evaluate it carefully and objectively. So it's, it's too easy to say, okay, my user told me that this system is uh, useless, so the user is stupid. Huh? It's easy as a conclusion. So saying, okay, the user, um, okay, I don't care. You, you, this is your thought, okay, I don't care because uh, I don't think it's uh, worth enough considering that. Well, be very wary because that, that can be the most precious information. Some users don't like the system. Well, do the users don't like the system because the system is not good or because you didn't describe it well? In both cases, you have something to learn. Something, how to describe it better, or how to build it better. Okay, then you, you will always find somebody with, that must be ignored, of course, because... Uh, but uh, before ignoring a comment, uh, just consider it always, objectively. You know, you are, you are in love with your ideas, and it's very easy to find uh, comments about the ideas as personal comments against you because it's your dream, okay? So try to be objective. Consider, okay, these good users are telling this. Why are they telling this? How can we improve our idea, our proposal, so that these users will be happier? Of course, we have then to decide. Hmm? So we need to adapt our vision and then to make also strategic choices. Because you may have two different groups of users, one that we say they want it darker, and one group they say they want it lighter, just to make super examples. And it's your product in the end. You, make, you must choose which group of users to satisfy and which group of users to discontent and to abandon. And to say, okay, you will not be my target users. You cannot be, make everybody happy because your system will be so complex and so without an identity that will not be desired by anybody. Hmm? Do you want it cheap or do you want to, uh, to have a very good uh, design, for example? Hmm? You want uh, your more shiny and more, uh, or more plastic, for example? You, you cannot have both. Okay? You must make choices. You can understand what, what are your target. That's why it's important to have a, a, a target group of users. What are my users? 
I want to get feedbacks for the, the type of users that are going to use the system. So about the users is there are, that needs to be queried in some way, they need to be the person that will be the final targets of the system and will interact the system on a daily or weekly or whatever basis. Or at least, uh, you can, uh, if you can find the, those exact people, be a person with similar characteristics. So I will, will, I will build a system for the users of this classroom. OK, I would need the students of next year that will use the system if we do that in this classroom. Well, it's very difficult to find who are the people that will come here next year. But uh, I can find a similar population of other students. So they're not the actual users, but they are comparable in terms of uh, profiles. Hmm? Um, these users don't need, don't want to understand how the system works. You should not let that the people sit there and uh, listen to three hours of classes to understand how the system works. You should start from this short description and say, okay, let's discuss about this idea, this scenario, huh? this prospect. But they, but they need to understand how they will interact with the system. So how they, what is their role? What they will do, not what the system will do. Not how, or how the system will do it, even less. Hmm? So you, you, we, we need to get in touch with some users. Maybe two person, maybe 20, maybe 200. But if we do zero user interviews, uh, well, it's very risky for us. Hmm? Because then we believe we know any, everything about our users. Wow. Don't, I don't believe it. And then you have a, a, a wider set of persons which are not uh, only the users, but in general the stakeholders. The stakeholder is a very strange word that uh, says somebody who has some sort of interest that the system would be successful. Somebody who is paying for it, somebody who is selling it, somebody who maybe say if, if the system improves the efficiency of uh, some employees or some workers, then the person who is paying these workers is interested that the system works well. So that his workers work more efficiently and his, maybe, company will be more efficient. But he is not the user of the system. Hmm? So in general, persons that will be happy if the system works well, for many reasons. Okay? For the economical reason, for the efficiency reasons, uh, uh, for having better control, better security about the system, uh, about the people or the system, and so on. They uh, may have a better understanding so understand better what people are doing, and so on. And usually this interest in some way is uh, bound to, to the funding, to the business model of the system. Hmm? So these are also important because they can give you the sustainability of the solution. They are also very dangerous when they try to say, I know my users, kill them. Hmm? If you are a stakeholder, you are not a direct user, you're not the type of person that will be using the system, don't tell me details if you were the, the user. It's important what you say, but not about the interaction part, because it's not your. What's important is what you would say, what are the outputs of the system, what are the qualities that you expect from the system, what is the information that you expect out of the system, what is the efficiency, and so on, but not about the interaction, because that should be actually be designed around the specific users. OK. Um, of course, the, there is some overlap in between these two, because the users usually are also stakeholders. If I'm using a system today, OK, I, it's my interest that the system is working well. So in addition to be a user, I'm also a stakeholder. Some books call them the primary stakeholders. Okay, and then there are the secondary stakeholders that are not users. And in some cases, it can be difficult maybe to involve the users. If you imagine something for maybe very small children, 
it's very difficult to involve them to get their attention uh, or people I don't know with disabilities so it's very difficult to involve them directly so you must go indirectly to some people who knows them but these are corner cases the general printed policy always try to understand the users and uh, this uh, is a concept that the users know better <laughs> they can't explain it they can't understand it but a user is able to know to feel to, to tell whether something pleases them satisfies them or just uh, is something that they, they would like to avoid and there's a whole uh, world of design methodologies that are under the name of UCD, user-centered design. User-centered design today is, is a very strong discipline, especially for, uh, say, for the uh, web applications and mobile applications, something like that, where the user experience is very important. Where the user attention and user fidelity must be gained in fractions of a second. If you go to a website and you find it ugly, you find it difficult to use, in less than one second you just decide, yeah, I will never go back there. Without uh, a training, without... Uh, and so the, the design should be done very, really very carefully. So there are methodologies for doing that, uh, with a set of techniques uh, on how to involve the users in every step of the design process. Well, not every, every, but at least in the initial ones, and in the final ones. Not in the bugging, of course. Um, so, uh, if we had uh, probably 20 hours more, we would like to spend them in discussing with you user-centered design methodologies. Because, uh, uh, well, there is uh, the, the, um, some standard that tells us what human-centered design for interactive system actually is not for ambient intelligence but in general for interactive systems that tells actually every step of the design process should involve in some way the users the processes are iterative and the design is refined by the evaluation coming from the users so at every step the user will tell you something and that make you think about what you can change or improve or add or remove from the system and the design team includes multidisciplinary skills and perspectives. That's why we like that in this room uh, you, have, you are from different engineering backgrounds. It will be difficult to work uh, together, we know. Hmm? But it will give you value because you can you know, give your experience in your field. Not everybody yeah. writes the program, but not everybody will do the design, not everybody will do the interface. Uh, and the different skills uh, need to be combined because there's not a single point of view because uh, users are, are not machines they have many points of view and you need to satisfy them by all of them uh, i would say we will spend 20 hours probably in describing the conceptual tools that we use in user-centered design for example there is a tool that is called personas personas are a dis uh, description of an imaginary person that has the characteristics of our users. So instead of saying users, 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 I, we call them Bill, or Jane, or Jack, or Joseph, or whatever. And then I will have a, a description of what uh, Jane is, the age, the job, and so on, so that I can understand her, her needs in this case. So I create imaginary person and I can play with these persons and talk to them imaginarily, of course. Don't you have also an imaginary friend when you were kids? Okay, it's the same. But then you decide the characteristics of this person that you want, you want to talk to. So you, you can simplify your user analysis, analysis to taking prototype profiles in a way. And you can play with this person by telling stories, scenarios in which these people do things with the system. So it's much easier and much easier to understand and to describe if you are talking about people doing something, you are telling a story, a scenario, instead of having a list of specifications which is uh, much, uh, much harder to understand. And this scenario is made of many small steps of iteration. 
that we call use cases. Because now Jane wants to close the door. And so let's describe what are the interactions between Jane and the system until the door is closed. So scenarios are the description maybe of, a, of one day, and use cases are the individual activities that you do during this way. Each use case has a specific goal. You do th something for a purpose. And so the use case is satisfied when the purpose is reached. This is a very, very summary, OK? Uh, all, uh, say, user-centered design and part of a software engineer does this, and you need to, 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 to do that. But we don't have time to, to, do, to learn everything in this course, of course. And you have techniques to do this. How to involve the users, how to get information out of the users. So you have the focus group, the field research, questionnaires, interviews, and, and a lot of, of, of tricks and of tools, of methodologies you know, that you can find uh, creating a prototype of the system, something which is not the system, but behaves in a similar way, putting the user there and see what is their reaction. This prototype can be a high fidelity prototype, so they look like, like the final system, or low fidelity prototype, maybe just a paper. Okay, some paper prototypes in which you switch uh, papers to simulate an interface. Or you can have uh, one person hiding, moving, switching the lights on or off manually to understand the reaction of the users when something is changed. Some experience in which you actually gather uh, um, the evaluation of the users and the usability that users get from the system. Hmm? So, um, after that, we will have more, we will be more aware of what the user think about our ideas. We did some effort to present the idea to the user, to us, for, from them, to learn their point of view. And this will give us a, a very strong priority for different system features. So we imagine a system that does five things, and I understand that the users like two of them. So it's better to, the other are still important. But it's better to get these two right and to make them work first. Because they are the ones that are going to attract or to satisfy the users most. It's very difficult to evaluate the priority by yourself. Usually, the designer puts as the top priority what he understands best. And the, low, and the least priority what he doesn't understand yet. Okay? Uh, but then it means that it builds a system which is very unbalanced. So the users are able to filter what are the important features and what are just, OK, it might be nice to have also this feature, but it's not so important for me. And uh, also the design constraints uh, that come from the users. Uh, OK, it's very nice, I like it, but it shouldn't cost more than 20 euros. And it's a constraint. It should be nice to look at. I would never put that in my living room, sentences like this. And of course, you have to mediate all these user inputs that you should consider them, but then mediate and integrate them with your product strategy. At the end, the product is yours. You select, you decide what to get or to gather from the user and what to stand back, to what to set back. <laughs> and uh, making some choice, it's a strategic choice at this point. So you are transforming what was a good idea with a vision to a system that users want. You are sharing the appreciation, the love with your ideas with some users. Maybe just your grandmother, uh, in a minimal case, but uh, uh, it's, it's at least checking with somebody outside the design process. Okay? The next step would be to take this uh, information and uh, these choices that we made and uh, let's say, write them in a more ordered way in a requirement document, which is the document that can be used for, say, closing the analysis phase or the specification phase and starting the implementation phase. Okay? At this point, we have, we have to, to stop here. We will uh, continue from this uh, next uh, week uh, with the rest of the process. Uh, because I want to, uh, so if we, if we can stop the part one of the, of the class. Possiamo chiudere la prima. And uh, 